Vice President, distinguished panelists, dear guests, uh, after lunch is uh, perhaps not the best time for serious discussions. However, I very much hope that those of you who had enough time not only for lunch but also for conversation during break, I think you already have mentally inclined to actively participate in our uh, after lunch session. Perhaps economics also is not a very sexy topic for those who are most interested in politics, in liberal democracy, and other legitimacy, or legitimacy of democracy, and so on and so forth. But I would argue that maybe it's not true. For me, as an economist, economics always is a very exciting topic. And today, the focus of our discussion will be in the context of uh, uh, centenary, the history, economic history of crisis management. Because it seems to me that uh, it's fair to say that the history of European economics during the last hundred years was the history of managing, managing different crises. Crisis because of wars, crisis because of mass deportation, crisis because of political regime changes, and so on and so forth. And last but not least, also the recent deep uh, economic and financial crisis, which was uh, very severe for many European countries and actually for the world. Uh, what will happen next after 10, 20, 100 years, we, we don't know, but I'm sure that uh, uh, shocks comes and goes. The crisis also are most likely uh, unavoidable. But we can very smart, in a smart, wise way, manage this crisis. And today I have very distinguished panelists uh, at the stage with different experience uh, of uh, analysis of this crisis and management and also practical experience of tackling crisis. I would like to start this panel by uh, inviting, by giving the floor to rector of Wiedemus uh, um, University, uh, Gattis Krumic. Uh, Gattis uh, is actually, he has a, a, a double background. He has actually various backgrounds. He's a musician, as a matter of fact. But um, today it's not about music. Today we talk about economics and history. And the, his um, education combines deep knowledge of history with a deep knowledge of economics. Uh, Gaddis also was the editor of a very um, important textbook about uh, Latvian history, uh, which has been published in Latvian language recently, but I hope it will be published also in English, at least a version of this book. So, okay, Gaddis, floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Ina. Uh, yeah, my field is history, and because of that I will go a little bit deeper in history. But I will start with our book because four of us in this panel, we participated in this project, not only me, but uh, Martin, Valdis, and Inna. And uh, uh, why I will start with this book? Because uh, in last autumn, uh, in one conference, one of my colleague from Sweden, we discussed about uh, a lot of different things, and he asked me, why so big book. Who will read book more than 1,000 pages? It's not possible. It's no 21st century. Why? And my answer was, uh, it's because it's economic history of Latvia. If we will start to write economic history of Sweden with the same methodology, with the same approach, I believe we will finish with 250, 300 pages. Why? Because if we compare both history, uh, I suppose economic history of Sweden is pretty boring. Uh, if we look in different subjects, different aspects, for example, monetary policy, in Sweden, always crown, crown, okay, a couple of devaluations, maybe something, but uh, in Latvia, uh, currencies changed 12 times in 100 years. The same in governance in Sweden, the same national policy is the same national independent state. In Latvia, changed a lot of things. 
and this, uh, we cannot compare this level of turbulence in both countries. And this is several kilometers from Kyrgyz, the same region. So, and not only in Latvia, in Estonia, and Lithuania. Uh, if we look uh, to the political maps, uh, for example, European Union now in 21st century and uh, Soviet Union before collapse in 1991, only one uh, very small region uh, overlap, three Baltic countries. And uh, this is very significant aspect. So we moved from totalitarian Soviet Union in 13 years to European Union and NATO. It's very big success, of course, but it was very complicated. It was very complicated and transformation. Uh, we know that uh, other countries of uh, Central Europe, a lot of countries were satellites of Soviet Union uh, in this time, uh, about a half a century, but you cannot compare if uh, you are satellite or you in the system. So we were part of the Soviet system, unfortunately with a lot of different consequences. If we look, for example, in uh, some uh, budget aspects, so uh, in general, in Soviet occupation period, uh, Latvia uh, paid to central budget 18% uh, of all incomes. And other 18 uh, paid for military needs and uh, KGB in Latvia. So more than one third was uh, just uh, spent for some direct needs of Soviet central government. It's, and, this, we, and, and we can explain with this aspect why this difference between Baltic countries and, and uh, other parts of Soviet Union decreased with every year, because it was very big difference before Soviet occupation in 1940. Uh, maybe <coughs> another point for discussions. Uh, we have now two experience of independence in the uh, Baltic region, in Latvia. Uh, and. Uh, Sometimes we say really very different stories, and sometimes we ask questions uh, why it was so successful in 2030s. And so, after war, after destructions, after evacuation of all factories, all industry to Russia, we were really successful, more successful maybe in 90s. Why? And uh, my answer to this question is because of societies. Because before First World War, we were a part of, uh, we can say, global world. We were part of the European community. And Baltic region and Riga especially was one from very fast developed region in this time. And this was a really multicultural environment with a lot of different industries, different innovations. And, uh, if you look to personalities uh, from nine premier ministers of Latvia from uh, 20th, 30th of 20th century, seven had some experience, international experience in education or in job. Some seven from nine. In 1990, it was totally different situation. So uh, I believe that we, our society, if, if we speak about our society, uh, we believe that it really prepared for our independence, but we were prepared to vote for our independence in 1990, but we were not prepared for independent country. And this because of our society, because our society changed a lot in this half century, unfortunately. Or lose what we lost in this, for example, Second World War. Uh, we lost uh, two very important uh, national minorities uh, in uh, Latvia, a Baltic Germans and Jewish population. About 100,000 Latvians were killed in both occupation uh, armies, uh, Soviet and Nazi. And uh, 200,000 uh, emigrated to West and uh, a lot of people were repressed by Soviet regime. It's together uh, about uh, half a million. And what we received back in the uh, first 10 years of Soviet occupation in Latvia immigrated about more than uh, 40, 100,000 people from other regions of Soviet Union with another culture, understanding, and so. And this is one from my answers why it was so complicated in the 90s, because it was, society was really, really very transformed. And uh, uh, what I can say now? Mm, yes, and uh, another, another thing what, uh, is what I should uh, maybe uh, f finish my presentation with the uh, question of reputation of our region. 
So we should think about reputation of our region uh, because, uh, and this is very related with strategic communications. Uh, and uh, in the Soviet time, Baltic countries had very good reputation because they uh, uh, developed uh, better than it was in uh, this, uh, per other territories of Soviet Union. But and but and because it was uh, because of uh, higher standards of high quality in our countries, and it's very interesting how Soviet explains the situation. And Soviet explains the situation with uh, large Soviet investments in, Bank, in in Baltic countries. But it's totally lies because we invested a lot in Soviet central budget, especially in post uh, Second War uh, period. So we were donors of Soviet central budget. So it's I can say genius idea how you can explain this difference, yeah? And, but no, and, and it's very important to speak and understand for our, uh, for our society, you know, because this narrative what construct now in Kremlin is that uh, somebody always should pay for our region, for Baltic countries. It was Soviet Union, now it's uh, European uh, Union, so, and after maybe collapse of the European Union, Baltic countries will return to Russia and ask, please help us, so. This is important to understand an explanation. We, we should uh, speak about, discuss about such things. And uh, uh, I will finish maybe with some question what we can do in future. And uh, I believe that we should uh, just use our experience uh, from past, our flexibility, our ab adaptation and survival skills in different situations for the future. So we're pretty successful in many uh, things now, technologies, IT, for example. So we really open our society in our region, not only in Baltic countries, Central Europe, really open for new ideas. I see this uh, aspect in uh, my field in higher education and science. So our university is more open for some new ideas, maybe Western part of our European Union, so more conservative. Oh, no, no, maybe we should wait for something. So we should just, uh, this, uh, just use for the future. So, or problems from past. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you for this um, introduction. It was not a speech, but uh, I, I'm sure that you will intervene more during our discussion. But I just have one very quick question to you. Um, in the first panel, we talked about the uh, importance of the critical thinking and about this information war and so on and so forth. Um, about Latvia, there are so many uh, myths uh, disseminated everywhere. Um, and one of these myths is that Latvia actually was a very poor agricultural country before the Soviet Union. And only, you, you mentioned investment, but maybe you can give an example, I know it was in your book, uh, about the uh, industrial development of, of Latvia before, the, before actually occupa all occupations. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, it's second uh, part of this uh, Soviet myth, of the Soviet narrative, so uh, first part, because they invested in our countries. Why they invested in Baltics in Latvia? Because they said that Latvia before that was underdeveloped agrarian country. But it's what lies, because we had a lot of very uh, innovative industries. We produced a lot of radios, a lot of cars and so and uh, we focused our industry to needs of our society. We exported a lot of different things, and unfortunately, transformation of our industry, uh, the industry went on other directions for needs of uh, this uh, big uh, Soviet Union, not to our region or Latvia. So this is another, but this is genius how they use this real situation and this uh, difference in levels between Latvia and another part of the Soviet Union. They said that they invested, and we, can I understand that somebody visited Latvia in the 50s uh, from Soviet Union, he said, oh, really different, and everything for our money, so. And, uh, and now, we can, uh, now we discuss about some ungrateful bots. We, we don't say thank you for such investments, so this, thank you, and this is very important to say this is another factor, so. Yeah. Well, thank you. Actually, Latvia indeed uh, went through various adaptations and various ad adjustments <laughs> before the, first, the Second World War and after the Second World War. Uh, and um, 
in, when Latvia joined the European Union, and it was in 2004, it was the illusion that now the development will be uh, steady and without any shocks, and we will converge with the other our, uh, um, EU members. But unfortunately, in 2007, severe um, economic financial shock to, uh, actually uh, had enormously negative influence uh, on many European countries, including Latvia. And in 2008, we actually were confronted with uh, all uh, negative phenomena of this shock. And uh, Valdis Dombrovskis at uh, that time was Prime Mini uh, Minister President, Prime Minister of Latvia. And who else has uh, this practical experience in tackling the shock? So maybe you will share with us your 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 views and um, statements. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, good afternoon. Uh, so, uh, indeed, as regards uh, Latvia's uh, uh, economic development since we joined the EU, uh, on one hand, one can say uh, that uh, uh, joining the EU was uh, a major uh, stimulus for Latvia's uh, economy. We experienced uh, several years of uh, rapid economic growth. Uh, there were uh, uh, substantial uh, capital inflows, there were like uh, 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 easy, relaxed uh, credit policy uh, 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 by the banks, uh, but uh, unfortunately not all this uh, money was put to the productive use, and instead there was a, a, a consumption bubble, there was real estate uh, a bubble, and overheating of the economy. And at some moment, this uh, bubble had to burst, and global financial and uh, economical crisis uh, uh, actually uh, put an end to this bubble. And Latvia was a country which was actually most severely affected by uh, global financial and economical crisis in the EU. And from there uh, on, we had to uh, rebalance uh, our economy, uh, put uh, public finances back on track, uh, undertake uh, structural reforms to strengthen the competitiveness of the economy, uh, uh, put in place uh, uh, additional social safety net network to deal with the social consequences of the crisis. And uh, uh, all those uh, uh, things, of course, were very uh, difficult and uh, uh, very painful. So the question is, um, uh, was this uh, avoidable? Uh, and if you look at the uh, uh, economic development, and I think Poland is a good example, actually the only uh, Central Eastern European uh, country which went through the global financial economical crisis without recession. Uh, so uh, 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 if one would have pursued a balanced and uh, 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 more uh, strict fiscal and macroeconomic policy during the boom years, lots of this overheating was uh, uh, possible uh, to avoid. There was a possibility to have more uh, strict uh, uh, fiscal stance, so to avoid fiscal problems during the crisis. There was a possibility to uh, uh, restrict excessive bank lending, because indeed uh, in pre-crisis, in a boom years, we can talk about uh, excessive bank uh, lending. Uh, and there are tools how uh, <coughs> countries can uh, uh, affect this. There were uh, possibilities to uh, tackle rap rapid inflation uh, uh, because inflation reached double uh, digits and uh, anti-inflation plan of that time government was put in place already with a delay. And I think that's the main uh, lesson uh, from the uh, crisis that uh, we uh, must be uh, also uh, 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 cautious when pursuing fiscal and macroeconomic uh, policies during the good uh, economic years, uh, the years which we are uh, uh, having uh, uh, currently, because if we allow balances to <coughs> accumulate, once external economic shocks come, uh, those economic imbalances turn into very big uh, economic problems in a uh, country. So there, uh, I would say it's important to stay in, on, on course with responsible fiscal and macroeconomic policies and uh, um, uh, continue uh, along the lines of EU economic policy priorities of stimulating investment, pursuing structural reforms to modernize the economy, and uh, once again, a fiscal responsibility. Thank you. Well, it is very 
short <laughs> answer. Thank you uh, for this. And uh, maybe today it's quite um, easy to uh, look ahead, to, to, oh, no, excuse me, to look at the past and, um, in, and actually describe uh, without passion in a very reserved manner what has been done. But in fact, um, in Latvia, uh, I, I, I just recall when uh, the government of Aldis Dombrovskis came to the power, it was the impression that this is a uh, government of suiciders because they had to implement very unpopular reforms to cut wages, uh, to cut uh, budget uh, spending on different social needs. Uh, and uh, it has to be extremely unpopular. And in some countries, I'm sure that this government uh, would have uh, no future. But um, in Lat Latvia, actually, and this is, it seems to me, a very interesting case for textbooks, uh, showed absolutely different example when the trust in the government, when the confidence was that high, that despite all these unpopular measures, uh, Valdis Dombrovskis was re-elected three times. And uh, how can you explain, actually, this phenomena? Why it was not possible in Greece, for instance, or, uh, I don't know, in Portugal? <laughs> Uh, well, uh, of course, it's always too, uh, uh, difficult to compare uh, countries, and there is no uh, one uh, side uh, fits uh, all. So I can uh, explain uh, some uh, reasons which I be uh, believe were uh, relevant in uh, Latvia. Uh, first, my government came in uh, office in March uh, 2009, when uh, crisis were, was already in full swing, when Latvia was already in IMF program, uh, when uh, uh, Parex Bank has already uh, uh, collapsed, and uh, we uh, came into government from the opposition. So, in a sense, we were not blame, blamed for creating the crisis, but rather seen as the ones which will help to deal with the uh, uh, crisis. And uh, uh, also uh, there, in terms of re uh, uh, responsible fiscal uh, policy, uh, uh, our party has consistently actually emphasized the need for uh, 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 responsible fiscal policy, also during so-called boom years, uh, so we're consistent with this uh, uh, message. Uh, and uh, second, uh, because uh, when uh, we did necessary uh, fiscal adjustment, which we did in a uh, front-loaded way, uh, we were able to restore financial stability and with this return to the economic growth uh, uh, relatively uh, quickly. So already in the second half of 2010, we were back to year-on-year -year growth. So to say by the time of the elections, we had already uh, something to show and to see that the uh, uh, economic policy strategy of dealing with the crisis is uh, working and we are returning uh, to the uh, economic uh, growth. And I would say uh, during the crisis there was also, so to say, understanding, realization in the broader society that we are in a crisis, that we need to uh, act to overcome uh, uh, the crisis. So I'd say it was a combination of those uh, three uh, uh, factors, and it may well be that in other countries there were like under, uh, other combinations of factors which were at play. Well, thank you. Uh, you mentioned in your intervention IMF, and next to you there is our Polish uh, guest, guest from Poland, uh, Professor Marek Belka. At the time of the economic crisis in Latvia, he used to work in the IMF as a director of economic department, if I'm not mistaken. European department. Euro uh, excuse me, European department. <coughs> and um, uh, Marek Belka also used to be prime minister in Poland and minister of finance. So his basic experience and background is very similar to uh, Valdis Dombrovskis, who also used to be prime minister and minister of finance. So, um, uh, Marek, what is your opinion about lessons learned from Latvian crisis? Well, thank you for inviting me to this uh, conference. Uh, I will spend a little bit more time than Valdis, but uh, he's well known uh, in Europe for his crisp 
and even dry assessments, uh, even uh, if the assessment is on his own country. But don't expect Valdis to be objective <laughs> about Latvia. Come on. This would be unreasonable. Neither am I objective. But my point of view, my, my um, picture of uh, Latvia of 2006, 2010, differs, differs slightly. Of course, uh, all uh, that is important now is, of course, uh, what are the lessons that we can draw from, from the crisis in the all three and many more republics in our region. Uh, first question is that what, was Latvia an innocent bystander or was it a, um, hit by the, the crisis uh, because of uh, its own mistakes? And uh, what we heard from Valdis Dombrovskis is, well, don't uh, forget about our own faults, our own um, wrongdoings. And, and, and of course, the first candidate would be uh, the fiscal, to lose fiscal policy. And the second would probably be uh, our uh, or your lose uh, bank regulation, especially to, to the ones like Parex Banka. Well, I still, uh, okay, I, nobody can deny that the fiscal position of, of Latvia was unsustainable in, in the run-up to the crisis. But look at Estonia. Estonia had almost zero public debt. And it suffered the same, the same hit, the same shock. And uh, the only difference from uh, Latvia was that they were probably a bit more clever uh, in which they start, uh, in, 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 because they started to react to the crisis one year earlier, which made a big difference at that time. But, you know, the more prudent you looked to the outside world fiscally, the more attractive you were as a destination of capital inflow. You, have, you had nothing to, I mean, you were too small. So was Hungary, so was Romania, not only the three Baltic states. You were too small to, to um, prevent a massive, devastating capital inflow that happened. Second thing, well, maybe it was because your, uh, your bank regulation was to lose, and you had no experience in uh, uh, in in how to deal with uh, you know credit unsustainable uh, exuberant uh, credit activity of of your banks of your banks of the banks that uh, were functioning in in Latvia. Well. And here, of course, the case of Parex Banka is, is, uh, is a clear candidate for, uh, for deep inspection. Uh, the rest were Swedish banks or Scandinavian banks. Look at Estonia. They had no Parex Banka and still they suffered a very similar story. Uh, I once uh, had a conversation with um, Stefan Ingves the, um, the governor of uh, Swedish National Bank. Of, uh, and it was about the behavior of Swedish banks in Latvia and in other um, two neighboring uh, Baltic states. He was complaining about the behavior of, 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 the, of the banks at that time. He said, I was telling the banks stop uh, aggressive uh, lending, uh, especially uh, housing-related uh, banking uh, lending, because it's unsustainable. And the banks, let me quote him, told him to get lost. It's not your business. 
we look great. Uh, we uh, con uh, conform to all the uh, regulatory uh, metrics uh, used, both in Sweden and in Latvia or Estonia. This is very profitable. Just shut up. And he had no legal means to prevent those banks to behave as they, were, as they behaved. So, basically, when a crisis like this hits, there is very little a small country like Latvia or Estonia can do. What is different in the case of Latvia and in the case of such countries like Greece, for example, or Portugal, to a lesser extent, is that contrary to those countries, you have a very strong, very strong state and very good historical collective memory that helped your governments to do what was necessary. I remember when, I, uh, when we put up the program uh, at the um, IMF, which was not really the IMF program, because most of the money came from outside of the IMF. Latvia was too small for the IMF to, to provide enough money to close the financial gap. Additional money had to come from the EU and from Sweden, well, from other countries, even my own country at that time showed solidarity in uh, lending probably 200 uh, million euros, as, as far as I remember, which was not a uh, trivial amount of money, repaid to the last penny. Uh, but uh, I remember when we put up the program, nobody in the department wanted to present it to the executive board. Normally it is the chef, chief of mission or deputy director. This time nobody wanted. So I had to do it uh, because there was I mean, very few people at the IMF, at least at the executive board, believed in the success of this program. Especially the Latin Americans. They say, well, this is going to be like Argentina. Believe me or not, but my only big argument is, was at that time that Latvia is not Argentina. Latvia is a country that had a history of going through crisis. When we asked the guys like Valdis, not exactly him, I don't remember talking with Valdis at that time. I was too small a guy at, at the IMF. When we, remembered, when we asked the Latvians, how did you manage to go through the crisis at that time? Said, what crisis? A crisis we had when our people were deported to Siberia. This is just a sort of a temporary difficulty. This, by the end of the day, made Latvia and Estonia and Lithuania resistant to crisis, resistant to shock. And they did, you did, the right thing. You were the heroes of, that, of those days. Other countries that had a collective memory of something like, you know, Aristotle, Leonidas. It was not enough. It was not enough. I am very serious. This is not a joke. To have a reasonable economic policy, you have to have a very strong state, like in Latvia. And this is the most important lesson that we can draw from this crisis more important than the lessons that are purely economic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marek. I would like to continue with uh, Dr. Martin Kazaks, who is working for S Swedish banks, Swedbank, <laughs> right? Because well, <laughs> the Sweden banking sector has been mentioned many times today. Um, Martin has, is well, very well known not only in Latvia, not only in the Baltics and Scandinavia. Um, he really is um, one of the brightest economic minds 
uh, in Latvia. And okay, with this introduction, I, I know that you, at least in the in this uh, monograph, uh, which has been published, uh, your article, uh, your paper has been aimed uh, at uh, comparis comparison <laughs> of experience of three Baltic states, right? So I don't know whether it will be your intervention today. Hopefully <coughs> so. Mm -hmm. the floor is yours. Thank you and for a very kind introduction. I, well, I don't think I deserve that. But uh, before I go on to some micro level uh, comparisons, kind of some of the really kind of bullet point things, uh, just I don't think what else really on a kind of larger scale I can add after the previous speakers. And uh, I think I fully agree with uh, Marek's point that the Baltics would have been hit by the train anyway. You know, we are small open economies. The global environment was very exuberant. In the economics profession, there was this uh, faulty or mis kind of mistaken view that income convergence within the EU happens by default. You know, it's almost God's given. Whatever you do, it will come. You know, and you can lend against future incomes without kind of relatively strong risk assessments or something like that. So it's kind of, it's all up for grabs, you know. And the kind of also disguised with these kind of micro level uh, distorted, uh, you know, for instance, uh, incentive schemes in terms of pay and bonus systems, which we saw replicated also in the Baltics, but also very vivid in, in the global financial markets. By and large, you know, it was it was the train coming down at you, and the only question was how badly you're going to be hit. And uh, the Baltics were in relatively good shape, and I would say that societal uh, backing of those reforms and knowing that things can be worse, and that in 1990s, just a bit more than 15 years ago, GDP had contracted not by 25% in two years, but by 50% in two years. So, you know, when you got paid not in a depreciated currency, but you got paid in socks, you know, which you tried to sell on later on somewhere, you know, things could have been worse. So this resilience on the societal level is very, very important. But coming back to some of the uh, points that I wanted to bring out in terms of perhaps what could be the, the lessons from the Baltics, from the Latin experience mostly, but in some cases also comparing across the three Baltic states, uh, Marek also mentioned Estonians starting to adjust somewhat earlier. Yes, maybe they, could, they were a bit smarter, but in a way they were helped by Russians. You know, there was this 2007 Alyosha thing in, in Estonia. There was this cyber attack on the, uh, on the Estonian state, on the institutions, on the enterprises, and things like that, which kind of reduced their uh, optimism already. So they went, they hit the wall, they hit the wall at a slower speed. And the same thing with, with Lithuanians. Lithuanians simply were late to the party because their credit cycle started later and they didn't manage to build such a big bubble. It's not because they were smarter as for the Lithuanians part. They were simply lucky because they were late. Okay. But still the crisis was very deep for all three countries in Estonia and Latvia somewhere in the range of 20 to 25 percent of GDP drop, GDP drop in a matter of a year and a half and in Lithuania something like 15 percent. So massive shocks to the economy with massive unemployment rates. Uh, but anyway, uh, coming back to the, to the uh, first point by Inna saying that uh, economics uh, is boring, I would say economics is not boring. Uh, especially during the crisis. For economists, there is no better time than crisis because then you can see what's going on, you know, and then the life is, is interesting. And if you take a look at the Baltic crisis of, of late 2000s, then I would pick out a couple of points that I think are important. The first one is the time is of importance. The time is of essence because we moved very quickly and that helped to restart the economy very quickly. Why? Because you know, it's better to take pain easy, to, to take pain early because, uh, you know, the reform fatigue will set in very, very quickly. Okay. So if one moves very quickly, you know, this is really helpful. 
and the public ownership, and it has been stated in many EU and IMF documents, is critical, so that people know what is going on. Now, and of course, uh, that is very, very helpful. Of course, playing good cop, bad cop with the IMF or the European Commission is always very helpful as well. You know, you can always blame somebody else for the hard decisions. But at the end of the day, Valdis had to take the, the you know, the very hard decisions and, and well done. You know. um, so, more quickly, because the window of opportunity is very, very brief. The second thing, what I would also say, when one looks at the at the medicine used to get out of the crisis, one also has to look at the structure of the economy. And the Baltics are small open economies with relatively large and well-diversified export sector. So we could grow out of recession by exporting. We could export ourselves out of recession. Greeks, well, they didn't have the public buy-in into that one, and at the end of the day, they didn't really have and still don't have a proper export sector. Just to give you some numbers, in the Baltics, Latvia had the smallest export sector, which was 40% of GDP. Lithuania and Estonia had large export sectors. By the end of crisis, in three years, Latvian export sector stood at 60, approximately 60% 60 of GDP. And the export sector is relatively well diversified. If you take a look at Greece, in Greek case, exports about 20% of GDP and not that well diversified. So what does that say? It says that, well, one size does not fit all. So Baltic case was relatively, I would say, unique and applicable only for specific, uh, specific cases. Uh, then the third point that I would like to raise and this was already mentioned, is the quality of institutions. The quality of institutions is very important because it allows you to act quickly. If tax compliance is very weak, if the, sh if the shadow economy is very large, then the gov government's fiscal stance is very poor. And that means that it's very difficult uh, to buy uh, confidence on the global financial markets. Um, but quality of institutions is also extremely important when one looks at the costs of recession over medium to longer term. And I will bring out two things, shadow economy and uh, transparency of financial flows. And here it's very interesting to compare Latvia and Estonia. What we can very clearly see is that uh, larger shadow economy and less transparent financial flows have meant for the financial sector, that the leveraging in the Latvian case is much, much deeper than in the Estonian case. Okay? So it strengthens the negative impact of economic hysteresis in very many, many areas, especially in credit channel for monetary policy, but also most likely in terms of demographic uh, situation, namely emigration. So the labor market recovers later, there is more job loss, and there is more loss to the future long-term growth. Um, so, what about the future? Kind of these, I think, were three interesting things to, to, to bring out about the experiences of the, of the Baltic recession, but what about the future? What, what are the implications from the Baltic uh, perspective that could be important for the EU going forward? And I would bring out two issues, one demographics, the other one is fiscal sustainability. Uh, as of fiscal sustainability issues, currently it seems that the Baltics are doing quite nicely. You know, the debt uh, levels are relatively small, but the problem is that we are aging. Okay? And in some cases, we're also shrinking in terms of population. We want a very good welfare state, okay? so this is not a very nice combination when one also adds free labor mobility within the EU. Okay? So free labor mobility is given, then you still have uh, high income inequality and you have aging. And that will, at the end of the day, well, to say it bluntly, pensioners are poor, they are voters, and their size in the population, their share in the population is rising, which means that this could translate in the future into the fiscal risks. And that could undermine political stability, and that could undermine economic stability. 
Okay? So uh, I think this is an important thing one takes, when one takes a look at the future, is to think how one can reduce income inequality, make growth uh, inclusive, so that the skills are appropriate, that health is appropriate, because people will age, and that means they will need to work longer. Okay, so quality of life, quality of skills, looking forward, is very important, not only for the Baltic region, but for many European economies. That is the only way that could drive future growth, in my view. Okay. But overall, just to conclude, I would say, from the, especially what we saw in the first uh, panel uh, today, is that peace and prosperity is not God's given. One has to work for that. And the earlier we start doing that, the better we will be. The better the shape of ours is going to be when the next crisis hits. And there's going to be a next crisis. Thank you, Martin. Thank you also about your, uh, uh, some ideas about the future development, inclusive growth, quality of life, which goes beyond the border of the Baltics. Mm -hmm. And it's my great pleasure now to pass the floor to our Finnish guest, uh, Mr. Juhana Varianen who has a research background. He used to be uh, director of uh, research, Economic Research Institute, but now he is a member of uh, parliament uh, already for three years. And uh, I know that um, in Finland, uh, the, the history after the Second World War uh, was very different from, from Baltic state experience and Finland actually during Cold War was quite a successful country. Uh, but nowadays, um, uh, it seems to me that uh, economic uh, development is um, it's not bad, of course, because you, are, you still have achieved certain prosperity in your country, but uh, unemployment is quite high and you have a lot of structural problems. So uh, what do you think how to get out of this um, uh, stagnation and uh, to, to, to the new growth? Yes, uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairperson, and thank you for inviting me in this conference. Uh, very nice to listen to this talk of a strong state and long-term commitment to responsible fiscal policies. I mean, this is often my, my sentiment when I talk with people from the Baltics. There is not much sort of postmodern or post-Keynesian nonsense. Somehow you have this collective memory and a kind of resilience that dates not so far back that you, you understand that a small nation with a a, a large, unpredictable neighbor can ill afford irresponsible economic policies. And this is something that comes out very clearly from many of these impressive talks that I have been lis listening to. Well, my background is that I, am an, I have been in politics for three years. Before that, I have been an, an applied policy economist in Sweden for many years under, under Finance Minister Anders Bori, and then uh, in Finland, uh, mainly working with uh, the application of economic, economic analysis to good economic policies. And let me just take up two themes that, uh, that sort of inform my work, and I hopefully they relate to some themes that have been aborted here. I mean, it's clear, as many people here have emphasized, that good, ec good economic policy from a small open economy perspective. It, it, it entails working for, a, for an open liberal economic order. We understand that, that responsible sort of globalization and the international division of labor and economic openness is what really builds, underpins our high standards of living. We small nations, we understand that. We understand as, as as Mar Valdis Dombrovsky so perfectly explains, that we must have a long-term commitment to responsible fiscal, fiscal policies. And, uh, but when one thinks of the entire policy package in the long run, what is good economic policy, then I, I guess that, that the, the experiences of the last years and the last decade 
really also teaches us that it's a very sort of narrow path or a tightrope between sort of hard-headed realism and, and fiscal responsibility and then sort of soft hearts for good social policy and social insurance. Since it's clear that if the, the we know that sort of market capitalism is what, what creates wealth, it makes us wealthy on the average. But it seems also clear when you look at countries like the United States or the UK after Brexit that if a large part of, of, of the population really feels deprived of the fruits of economic growth, then in sooner or later they will start sort of listening to the siren songs of, of economic populists or nationalist populists, and that will then undermine the basis for responsible economic policies. So somehow, I, when I give, if you give advice to decision makers, I feel like it's a very narrow path. You must, you must have a sort of clear head, hard-headed, market-friendly policies, but you must always think about the acceptability of, of, of market capitalism. And this, I, let's, supposing that you in the Baltic states, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, supposing you are very successful, and let's really hope so that, that the, the, the unpredictable neighbor will not undermine your, your economic success, then you will certainly see that, that this resilience, which is due to the collective historical memory that Marek was talking about, that will fade. And at some, in some time you will have a real issue with excessive demands for a social security system and welfare state that is very hard to finance in a time of aging and, and, uh, and where, when public finances will be under, under strain. And this really brings my, me to, to my other point, which is just to characterize the, 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 the Finnish case a little bit. I mean, Finland is obviously also a case of, of having a collective memory that might be fading now, but still, we were a case of very successful, rapid industrialization after World War II. And as you know, under the Cold War, Finland was between the East and the West, and the communist system and the market, the liberal market order sort of wanted to contest this part of the world where, where I happen to be born in, in Finland. We were between East and West, and everybody understood that we could not really afford economic failure. I mean, the, the, the Britons say that if you know that you are going to be hanged uh, tomorrow that will concentrate your mind wonderfully. And in some, some sense, the economic policy makers in Finland knew that if we did not succeed in generating rapid economic growth, then we might just be able to, not to survive as an independent economic nation. And that really, that, that built a sort of nationalistic project of rapid capital accumulation. And it built a, a political superstructure where there is a remarkable national consensus with trade union leaders, business leaders, bankers, and the political top leaders all sort of worked together in a, in a very interventionist manner. So it was a bit like a kind of uh, planned economy with a very high rate of saving and investment during the 50s, 60s, 70s, up to the, up to the 80s. And that was a remarkable success that took Finland from being a poor nation around the middle of the 20th century to a rich nation within Europe towards the end of the, uh, end of the Cold War. And yet, precisely as, as you indicated, I would maintain that now, when our welfare state is becoming much more difficult to, to finance because of rapid aging, and in an age when globalization is much more complete and encompassing, this very political structure where it is, in Finland, it is understood that everybody must agree on everything. And it's very hard to implement reforms unless everybody, sort of the trade unions and the, the business leaders and the, the uh, government and parliament all can agree on those reforms. And in times of these, when it is clear that we must increase, we must raise our employment rate and we must cut our high structural unemployment rate in order to, to 
rescue the public finances of the very encompassing welfare state that we have, then it is very hard to carry out these necessary reforms, mostly because the trade unions are opposed to them. And we are, have so far not been able to, to break this impasse of, of everybody being accustomed to a kind of consensual politics that was really a product of the Cold War and the, of the very narrow freedom of maneuver that we then had. But it still sort of permeates our minds like this. 200-year-old Karl Marx, Marx said that the, the history and the previous generations really weigh on the thoughts of the <laughs> present generations. This to some extent now hampers, <laughs> precisely as you indicated, Mrs. Chairperson, this hampers the current uh, economic uh, reforms and, and it is quite remarkable in a sad way that Finland has now the highest unemployment rate of the entire central and northern Europe. There are only Mediterra Mediterranean countries that have higher, a higher unemployment rate than Finland and our employment rate is far below our other Nordic neighbors and is far below the level which would really uh, uh, re be required to sustain the viability of the welfare state. So in that sense, the, uh, the, this historical uh, the political tradition that surely was necessary in the, in, during the Cold War has so far turned into a liability. But we will certainly, we will see in 10 years or 20 years, if you still invite me in a conference like this, whether this has changed. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Johan. I'm sure after 10 years you will tell us more uh, rosy story about Finnish development because we all wish you to uh, maintain this uh, high level of welfare state but also to go ahead. Look, I would like also to go a little bit beyond um, Nordic Baltic uh, countries and let me um, use my capacity of chair, chairwoman, and to ask uh, Valdis Dombrovskis one uh, question, which is which is going a little bit beyond uh, our discussion at this table. I would like to uh, ask you about Ukraine. I know that uh, uh, Ukraine is um, desperately trying to implement uh, many very difficult reforms to to. Uh, to maybe in the long term to become full member of um, uh, European Union. And I know that the U European Union is uh, trying to assist in many ways. So uh, what, uh, how could you, uh, um, could you tell us a little bit more about the European Commission efforts to, to help Ukraine to implement uh, Berlin reforms? Well, on this, uh, uh, first of all, uh, it must be said that indeed it's uh, important that the uh, uh, European Union uh, stays uh, uh, engaged uh, with Ukraine and uh, supports Ukraine uh, uh, during this difficult time when it's uh, 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 facing Russia's aggression. And uh, uh, as you know, uh, this conflict is still not uh, over. So uh, uh, what uh, uh, we have done so far, I would say we uh, have uh, intensified uh, uh, political uh, ties with Ukraine by uh, 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 signing and ratifying uh, association agreement, uh, deep and comprehensive uh, uh, free trade agreement, developing uh, uh, sectoral cooperation in a number of areas, uh, uh, allowing visa-free travel for Ukraine uh, citizens to the EU, and. Uh, 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 provided uh, financial support both through European financial institutions but also through our macrofinancial assistance uh, programs. And uh, currently uh, we are uh, in the process of uh, discussing fourth macrofinancial assistance uh, program to uh, Ukraine worth uh, 1 billion uh, euros. So European Commission has put forward a proposal and now it's in a process of uh, discussions with co-legislators, with uh, EU member states and European uh, Parliament and indeed uh, we hope for a, a quick uh, progress uh, there. 
Uh, and, uh, of course, our macrofinancial assistance program is also linked to the reform implementation in Ukraine. And it must be said that uh, if you look uh, and compare with the situation in uh, 2014, uh, Ukraine has actually implemented major uh, structural reforms in a number of uh, areas in uh, uh, improving the business uh, environment, in uh, energy sector, in uh, anti-corruption, in, in, in many different uh, areas. Uh, and uh, this uh, effort should uh, continue. Uh, of course, uh, we see maybe some slowdown of this uh, reform effort, and that was the reason uh, why we were not uh, able to disburse the last tranche in previous macrofinancial assistance uh, program, uh, especially as regards this uh, anti-corruption conditionality. And now we are putting basically uh, following up uh, those conditions in our new macrofinancial assistance uh, uh, program. But uh, uh, in any case, uh, uh, to summarize, I think the uh, reform progress in Ukraine has been very substantial if you look at the last four years and uh, it's important that EU stays engaged uh, and supports Ukraine. Thank you. Well, thank you, but I have one more question actually to you. Um, uh, all Baltic states and also Finland, we are uh, in core Europe. I'm talking about the country celebrating centenary. Uh, Ukraine is still outside Europe. Uh, but uh, some uh, uh, outside European Union, sorry. Um, in some countries like Poland, for instance, but also Hungary, Czech Republic, some others, uh, uh, um, they are member of the European Union, but they are not member of Eurozone. Uh, of what sort of um, instrument uh, do the European Commission develop to assist countries maybe with their structural reform to, uh, for accession of Eurozone if they wish? This is my first question. And second, how do you see uh, the big challenges for development of Eurozone uh, and what the European Commission has, been in, uh, has envisaged mm -hmm. to strengthen it? Well, uh, first of all, as regards uh, uh, countries which are still uh, outside uh, Eurozone, we know that according to EU treaty, uh, Euro is a currency for the whole EU and uh, uh, all EU uh, countries, well, except UK, which is on the way to leave uh, anyway, and Denmark uh, has actually a treaty obligation to join Euro once uh, conditions are met. Uh, having said that, there are no uh, uh, strict deadlines or enforcement mechanisms uh, how to actually make sure that countries are joining the uh, euro. So, by and large, it still uh, remains a uh, political choice of those uh, uh, countries. So, and this doesn't uh, change. So, uh, uh, therefore, first and foremost, it's a political decision in the member state to work towards euro adoption. So what we are currently proposing from European Commission side is uh, what we call dedicated convergence facility to support those countries which are working towards Euro adoption with uh, technical assistance, in uh, some cases also it may be financial assistance, so to make uh, uh, sure that countries are prepared to join Eurozone and can prosper once inside uh, uh, Eurozone. Uh, uh, speaking more uh, concretely, currently we have a clear uh, interest from uh, uh, Bulgaria, uh, from uh, uh, Croatia, uh, potentially from uh, some other countries, but I would mention Bulgaria and Croatia, which are currently, I would say, most concretely working towards uh, this goal of uh, Euro introduction. Uh, it must be said that also the Eurozone has changed since the previous uh, rounds of enlargement. Uh, and now uh, joining uh, the Eurozone also means joining the banking union. So there are new uh, issues, uh, namely uh, preparedness also of the banking sector and banking supervision in those countries which intend to join uh, uh, Euro. Well, talking about this broader deepening of uh, economic and monetary union uh, agenda, uh, indeed, we are now at a critical uh, stage and we expect uh, decisions to be taken 
by a June European uh, summit. And from European uh, uh, Commission uh, side, uh, we uh, put emphasis on completing the banking union. So the bank reform package of November 2016, uh, uh, fiscal backstop for a single resolution fund, uh, 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 European deposit insurance scheme, where we propose more gradual way how to uh, uh, introduce it, taking into account uh, concerns of the number of member states. And in general, uh, we see uh, two work streams of strengthening uh, Eurozone's uh, resilience and improving uh, European level shock absorption uh, tools. On this resilience side, it's mainly about supporting structural reforms in member states. That's why we will uh, come forward with uh, a dedicated reform delivery tool. And on the uh, shock absorption side, it's about uh, Eurozone fiscal stabilization uh, function uh, to protect the level of uh, uh, investment in a case of large asymmetric economic shock. Well, thank you. Some of the members of the panel, do you want to, to make any comments? Yeah, you? Yes, just shortly. Uh, I mean, this was an admirable exposition of, of this process from the point of the view of the Euro European sort of center or the European Commission. Just let me just remind that everybody that a country that wants to join the Euro basically has to take responsibility for its own uh, compatibility with the Euro. It's like joining a club where you then you will certainly be presented with instructions as to how to be behave in the club, but it is really up to you that you, you are up to, 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 to filling this task. The, the challenge or the, the sort of historical uniqueness of the Eurozone is that it's a, it's a monetary union with very little common fiscal muscle. And in some ways it's, it's a fascinating experiment, but it is quite a demanding task to be a successful part of the Eurozone, not least for my country, where I see in the, in the sort of labor market and the wage formation front, I see sort of continuous challenging ev challenges even ahead. How will we keep our competitiveness good enough vis-a-vis -vis the European core uh, and Germany? And then, of course, there's the, the elephant in the room, which is Italy, a country that does not grow and where the the, uh, the electorate shows very little appetite as to adopting policies that would make, in the long run, Italian uh, Eurozone membership somehow consistent with, with reality. Thank you, Marek. Well, Poland is not in the Euro, uh, in the Eurozone. And, uh, well, since the crisis, I would say, the the Polish governments um, were quite skeptical about rushing into the Euro. Uh, I think a very concrete negative uh, example of Polish behavior towards the Euro uh, was the denial of the Polish government around 2012-13 to join the banking union. Uh, the current economic, uh, the current political uh, situation in Poland is not conducive to the, uh, to the, to, to, to embracing Euro at all. And the main, uh, the main reason is political. Uh, I, I think that uh, no, no matter what we think about the cohesiveness of the Eurozone and the problems that it structural, deep structural problems that it has still. Uh, th the main feature of, of common currency is that it's a driver uh, of, uh, no matter what we think about it, ever depending integration. Uh, as long as we have common currency, there will be a big pressure towards bringing uh, economic systems, social systems 
of uh, Euro member states closer and closer. Uh, and uh, so you have to be Euro enthusiastic to join the Euro. It didn't really matter in 2004 or 2008. Now it's very clear. If you, if your government, if you are a country, declare that you want to join the Eurozone, it means that you are really for deepening European integration. If you happen, as it happens to be in Poland, if you happen to have a government that is deeply Eurosceptical, no matter what they say, then it's obvious that they are against the Euro. The uh, reluctance to join the Eurozone in 2010-2015 was of different character. What counted then was, well, we looked at the Eurozone, we looked at the most important structural issue in the Eurozone, which is the danger of deepening divergence between the elephant in the room and Germany, for example, Italy and Germany, uh, and the presumption that Poland was a very stable, economically a very stable country. Why should a very stable country join um, a grouping that was perceived not as a very stable one? Why should we import instability rather than, well, an export stability? Well, this was the, the reasoning that we had in 2009, 10, 11, up to 2015. In 2018, we had a different situation. Our economic policy uh, looks okay at the surface, but is not strengthening economic fundamentals. So we have a reason to be worried, at least some of us in Poland, and some of us in the European Commission, some of us in, in Europe, can expect that Polish economic policy in the longer term uh, is undermining uh, sustainability, long-term sustainability. Whereas, at the same time, econ uh, Eurozone looks better now than two years ago, than three years ago. Valdis mentioned the, the efforts to strengthen the banking union. But I would say that if I were one of the decision makers in the Eurozone or in the European Commission, I would be a very strong proponent of using uh, European whatever pot of money is there to strengthen, to strengthen uh, structural reforms in those countries that are laggards. It is in the best interest of Europe to help, let me even say, to bribe Italians to reform, even at the cost of others. But don't quote me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And uh, We already mentioned the role of uh, social memory of our society and economic process, and, but not always this is a very good thing. I just can give one example about creditation and uh, we know our experience in uh, last crisis is 21st century with our experience for, uh, in Latvian society I can just uh, give three examples that not always uh, Latvian society paid their debts uh, first time was uh, after first world war so Latvian peasants not pay uh, debts to Germans uh, for, for property. Second time was uh, when they collapsed economy in the uh, Second World War, and third time uh, when, uh, uh, when after collapse of Soviet Union. So always after are some uh, deep economic crisis uh, followed inflation and devaluation, and only once, and this is in the last crisis when it's not stopped and 
And before, always uh, it was like uh, nobody, we will not pay our debts, it will some, so, somehow happen. So, and maybe because of that, this unresponsible attitude to credits from society was you know, one of the parts of our crisis, because its crisis was not only macroeconomic process, but society was not ready for that. So this is aspect what we should uh, remember from our past and so, our memory, our memory, memory. So we should change society throughout education and different other things. So. Thank you. Now the floor is open for the question. Raise your hands, please. Uh, so I see one, two. I don't see any more so yet. So maybe ladies first. Yes, thank you to uh, you, Ina, and the panelists. Uh, Ina Sabirsnitsa was a member of parliament during Latvia's accession period, 1990s, early 2000 to EU. To all, to all that talked about the uh, positive resilience that we had in uh, Latvia and also in Estonia and Lithuania to the economic crisis, don't we have uh, to thank the strict requirements of the European Commission for accession, both to EU and to Eurozone, because that forced us to do things like raise our retirement age, things that haven't still been done in France, Italy and Greece. I mean, when the, we hear, read articles and people see they have small pensions and they're so much bigger than ours and they're complaining they have to raise the retirement age. So don't you think the fact that we had to meet the requirements, uh, honestly met the Euro criteria versus some other southern countries, and uh, some founding member states didn't, never, have never had to go through accession process to meet requirements of joining EU. Okay, we will collect a couple of questions. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Plata, I saw your hand. Yes, uh, thank you very much for very interesting presentations. Uh, Please introduce I'm, yourself, okay? Uh, yes, Jans Plattais. I'm, I'm from Fiscal Discipline Council. And uh, as, as, uh, you, you mentioned several times uh, the importance of fiscal responsibility. Uh, but here I have a little bit of question to understand how these things would develop in the future. Uh, so one part is that Latvia has uh, done pretty well in 2017 uh, compared to deficit at the amount of 1% to GDP actual uh, Eurostat evaluation is 0.5% deficit which looks quite good uh, but when I look at the debt figures that show, shows uh, quite big increase compared to deficit of 140 million euros uh, our debt increased by 700 million euros in one year. And this sounds on the high side. So what do you think? So uh, uh, isn't that time to look again at the matters, how we measure our fiscal responsibility and, uh, and how we include debt indicator? Because some countries tell, oh, you are under 60%, so you don't have to worry about this. Uh, still, uh, sometimes uh, these small things contribute and, and come up to quite big numbers. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, yeah, a lady from... Mm -hmm. uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Signe Martishun and I represent um, Association Business Against Shadow Economy. Um, I would like to thank all the speakers. Uh, particularly Professor Belka for giving a very positive evaluation of how we handled crisis, if, we, if I may say we. I understand that the role of this conference is to look at the before and after, but my question is about the present. And I would like um, particularly our maybe Latvian origin uh, uh, speakers to give a little comment about three things. The tax reform that took place and uh, came into force in January. Um, the closing of the um, ABLV bank and the so-called um, um, uh, crisis, not really banking crisis, but the <laughs> crisis type situation that we went through. And the last thing is uh, the latest uh, legislation on the shell companies. Thank you. 
Well, thank you. We already you, you, yes. the last, okay? Hello. Because, mm -hmm. My name is Mikhail Kazmerchuk. I'm a student from Ukraine, and my question is about reform in Ukraine. Uh, one of the requirements of the European Union was the creation of anti-corruption court in Ukraine. So, what do you think? Uh, will this court be effective, and uh, will it help to defeat or to reduce the corruption in Ukraine? Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I think in 10 minutes we have to make a big job. So maybe we will start from Martin Kazakhs from that side. Yeah? Okay. If you, if you don't mind. That was mm -hmm. fine. Lucky me. <laughs> uh, I will not tackle all the questions, but I'll just uh, touch upon some of them in the second round if Mr. I can come back with that. Um, as to the external pressure, of course. You know, and that's a sad story because there are no uh, institutions that we could enter anymore. You know, we're part of of EU, we are part of EMU, we are part of NATO, we are part of OECD, you know, and these were all extremely important drivers for institutional uh, improvements, okay, by all means. So we are left by and large with our own willingness and ambition what we want to do, so it's up to civil society, you know, and that's the, that's the I would say by and large, that's the story of the middle income trap, okay, if we want to really become uh, affluent uh, societies, not just well off as we are currently, uh, then it's up to the civil society to drive all these fundamental processes. And that is tough, and very few countries make it. So, will we succeed? We are in a good starting position. Will we make it? Well, the odds are less than 50%, significantly less than that. So, it's all up to us what the civil society will do. And. Uh, it's by and large race, a race against time, and one of the factors is aging. You know, it's, it's purely natural that when people age, their uh, kind of forecasting horizon gets shorter and shorter and shorter, which means that reforms that will bring unknown future benefits sometimes, you know, in the next decade or two, are less and less politically uh, appealing. Okay, so. It's going to be tough, but that's life, you know. Um, coming uh, back to the fiscal discipline issue, I will not go into the numbers and things like that, uh, just, you know, broadly sweeping across this, I would say, it's not that much at the current deficit level, uh, sorry, at the current debt levels that the Baltic countries have. Uh, Latvia and Lithuania in the range of 40% of GDP, uh, Estonia in the range of 10% of GDP. I would say it's not that important what the deficit is. Sorry, you know, I'm also kind of a uh, fiscal discipline council member, but uh, it's much more important what you do with the deficit, what you do with the debt. It's the kind of how well you spend the money. You know, if you just burn it, it's bad. If you invest it in healthcare, smartly in skills, in educations, and things like that, that's all welcome. If it makes future better in terms of growth, that's good, because out of these aging problems, you can only grow through the, and populist problems, only through growth. Uh, and the last thing that I will, will touch upon, um, tax reform. Uh, I, I would say it's very badly uh, publicized from the government's point of view but contains quite a lot of nice things. Okay. What is the outcome of that, we still don't know. It's too early to say. So, um, I think this is a very, one very nice example where the positive gains can very much be boosted by thought through uh, discussion driven by the government, explaining what is going on, how is this helping the economy to reduce all these misunderstandings. But at the moment, it's still too early to say. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm historian. You should wait for an answer some couple of years. So. OK. Marek, Marek. There were no questions really oh, for me. OK. Valdis. Uh, uh, OK, so I'll uh, try uh, to quickly go uh, through uh, all the questions. Uh, first, uh, on the question of uh, uh, accession uh, requirements and uh, uh, questions related to uh, pensions uh, uh, age. Well, uh, first of all, uh, 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 this question is more actually linked to the two uh, tendencies. One is uh, population aging, which is 
uh, 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 problem across uh, Europe, but I would say especially in uh, Latvia, uh, and a question of uh, uh, raising life expectancy. So if you look at those two uh, tendencies, so uh, a gradual increase in retirement uh, age uh, seems to be the way how to uh, tackle those tendencies, and that's why uh, also European Commission's uh, general recommendation in this area is uh, to have a link between retirement age and life uh, expectancy. And there, uh, I would say, uh, pensions reforms are actually taking place uh, across Europe, including in founding member states. So it's not, in, in that point of view, uh, linked with the uh, accession uh, uh, requirements. If you study uh, pensions reforms, you can study them from, I don't know, from Germany to uh, Italy. <laughs> uh, then uh, on the question on uh, fiscal responsibility and uh, debt uh, developments, well, uh, I don't have no in-depth uh, uh, comment on those debt uh, developments. I know that indeed uh, uh, debt has come up in 2017. Uh, uh, so, but of course, one has to see what is the underlying uh, reason, because it's often so that uh, debt management uh, authorities, and well, in Latvia's case, it's uh, Treasury. Uh, uh, typically uh, raises uh, debt if some large repayments are coming and then you can expect that during uh, the course of this year uh, actually uh, some previous debt repayments are uh, done and that's why this additional buffer had been uh, raised. But that's uh, indeed then uh, uh, to look uh, deeper uh, at uh, reasons on this. Well, in, in terms of the fiscal trajectory, uh, I was mentioning this also uh, 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 in the morning, so what we see is that uh, 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 we just issued our uh, spring economic forecast, and we see that uh, uh, in Latvia for next year, two years, we expect uh, 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 a budget deficit uh, slightly above 1% uh, of GDP, so this year and next. At the same time, uh, in uh, Estonia and Lithuania, which was uh, have economic development uh, speed comparable with Latvia, uh, they have either balanced budget or uh, fiscal surplus. So there is still some uh, uh, issues to uh, uh, follow in terms of uh, uh, Latvia's uh, debt, uh, sorry, uh, deficit trajectory and movements towards uh, uh, movement towards um, uh, uh, balanced budget. Uh, then uh, on the questions which were raised on uh, tax reform, well, on tax reform, uh, European Commission's uh, general advice in direct uh, taxation policy is to reduce a tax burden for labor, especially low paid labor, and shift it to other tax bases which are less detrimental to growth, like uh, consumption, like property, like capital. So, uh, from that point of view, one can say uh, that uh, Latvia's tax reform is uh, uh, heading in this direction, but actually only partly uh, meets uh, uh, this goal. But at the end of the day, we know that uh, direct taxation policy is uh, a policy of uh, member states themselves. So, at the end of the day, it's for government itself to take those decisions as regards uh, uh, direct uh, uh, taxation. Well, uh, 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 as regards developments in the banking uh, uh, sector, uh, I would say what uh, kind of discussions it has triggered also at EU level is a need to have closer uh, coordination of uh, uh, anti-money uh, laundering authorities, the work of uh, anti-money laundering uh, authorities. And there we are uh, uh, urging member states to uh, finalize and to transpose the uh, uh, fifth anti-money laundering directive on which there are uh, political agreement already which would allow uh, for more uh, uh, effective coordination of anti-money laundering uh, authorities also at EU level. Uh, and also we, uh, uh, from European Commission side, already some time before, uh, proposed uh, uh, to strengthen transparency requirements of beneficial owners of the companies, which uh, to the extent would also help to address the issue on uh, shell companies. 
Then on the question of uh, uh, Ukraine and uh, uh, anti-corruption courts. Well, uh, 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 strictly speaking, uh, this requirement of anti-corruption courts is part of IMF program, not part of our macrofinancial assistance program. But uh, uh, in any case, we know that um, anti-corruption issues are quite prominent also in our program. And in any case, for uh, macrofinancial assistance uh, programs to disburse funds to Ukraine, we also need IMF program being on track. So all those issues are uh, uh, linked. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, uh, we hope that strengthening this institutional framework of uh, fight against uh, corruption, including by setting up anti-corruption uh, uh, bureau, in, including by now uh, this work on anti-corruption uh, courts, on uh, uh, electronic uh, asset declarations, on uh, register of beneficiary uh, owners of the companies, that all those measures will help to address uh, uh, issues uh, with uh, corruption in Ukraine. Uh, you wanted to answer more? Yeah, I, I just, uh, I feel I was too abrupt on the fiscal issue. Uh, I think Latvian economy is growing quite nicely. You know, that only with one part, with the debt and expansion. But I think um, at the times when economy is growing well, and these are the years, one should be saving up. Okay, so of course, kind of within the uh, regulation we fall in in terms of deficit, fine. Okay. But then at the end of the day, if we do not save up now, then when? Okay. And uh, of course, this efficiency of spending, how well thought through is this? And currently, if you would ask me, are there any pockets, the multiple pockets, to improve uh, efficiency of the spending? Uh, the other thing which kind of sprang to my mind, uh, what uh, and I've been talking about the long-term growth and things like that, I would say one important thing that in this region especially, and Latvia for that matter as well, to need to look into the drivers of future growth is the role of cities. If one takes a look at Riga, Riga has been metropolis of this region. Is this remain such? Is its gravity or pulling power of financial means of uh, human uh, resources uh, going to remain as it is? Is it going to grow? Is it shrink? Well, we have an increase in competition on that. For instance, take a look at Estonia. Estonia very closely pairing Tallinn with Helsinki. Now, as for Lithuania, you know, Kaunas and Vilnius together are much bigger than Riga. And then, of course, the historic differences and arguments with Poland for Lithuania. But if they make, you know, their right decisions and they pull their act together, uh, pull their act together, then, you know, what's the Latvian role? You know, where does Riga stay? Is that as mighty as it used to be, or is it shrinking? If it is shrinking it's import in its importance, then for us to overcome the middle income trap as a nation state is going to be increasingly difficult, and I would say even impossible. So we should appreciate the role of cities. And Riga is the largest so far in the region, which adds to our opportunities for growth. Is this going to be the case in 20 years' time? Well, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Johanna? Yes, well, there was a, the issue of these accession conditions and, and commitments. And, of course, they do play a role, and, but it's, it, it's always a sort of two-directional issue since it is good if a commitment to some kind of responsibility, like not being able to devalue anymore in the currency union, that sort of entails, that will initiate uh, an improvement in the, in, the econ in the behavior of the economic policy makers. But this is a very small nation's perspective, and in this part of the world, we all take this very seriously. Our Prime Minister Lipponen, when he took Finland into, into the Euro, he was explicitly concerned about the security aspects of this move. He wanted Finland to be part of core Europe, which would really sort of take us away from this contested a place in international politics. But then you might have large nations like Italy, which perhaps does not really care. I mean, they still have a, they, they have had a corrupt state and good food for hundreds of years. And even if they go bankrupt, they will go on having a corrupt state and, 
and good food and even take the US I mean they can they can have completely irresponsible economic policies as they seemed to have now but they will still not sort of be invaded by Canada or Mexico and they will, they will still be there but this small nationness surely gives a kind of urgency to everything that people like us do and should do in, in economic policy. And to conclude, I'm very happy that this problem of and phenomenon of aging is taken up so prominently in, in this discussion. It is really an underlying force that, that explains much of the political problems and malaises of the European, European Union, weakness of public finances and all the, the repercussions of of, the, of those phenomena. And if you look at the European Commission's analysis of the sustainability of public finances in, in uh, Europe as a whole, then we are not still there. I mean, many European economies have in the long run ec public finances that, whose sustainability is not assured. So it's a, it's a, it's a huge challenge for us. Well, we are coming to the end of our panel, and uh, it was um, quite a rich uh, discussion, uh, and many issues have been raised today. So I will not be able to make a very comprehensive summary. However, I would like to say a couple of words uh, about some highlights of today's discussion. Uh, the discussion was aimed at, um, at the crisis management and the reasons for, for crisis. And we learned today that some crises are unavoidable. They were unavoidable in the past because of geopolitical situation, because of wars, because of deportations, and so, uh, because of changes of regime from democracy uh, to, uh, to totalitarians. And hopefully, uh, mostly of these 10 countries celebrating centenary and this year, they are member of the European Union, and the European Union is sort of guarantor of peace. It was uh, created as a peace project. So hopefully, these geopolitical risks uh, will be tackled. I would say that there are no risks; there are always risks, but hopefully, uh, they can be somehow reduced if we are together. But some economic crises are also unavoidable. Whatever we are doing, especially for the small open economies, and these are the lessons of a crisis in, in the Baltic states, for instance, severe economic crisis. However, uh, what we can learn, we can learn how to tackle the crisis, and uh, for doing this, uh, what we need, uh, uh, absolutely, uh, we need a strong state, uh, and um, it's good if we have historic memory like the Baltic states, but I'm sure that after a couple of generations, this historic memory will play less, uh, less role than today because even nowadays <laughs> our children, uh, I'm not talking about uh, gr uh, our uh, grandchildren, they, they have no memory at all about what has happened in the past. Okay, but what we need uh, instead, we need uh, ownership of reforms, this is clear. Uh, we need uh, quality of institution, quality of governance. And of course, uh, we need fiscal sustainability, but we shouldn't uh, forget about people, about social values, about inclusive growth, about quality of life, about quality of skills. And we are strong because we are together. We are together in the European Union, we are together in Eurozone, those who are members of Eurozone are stronger, but when we are member of the club, we should obey the rule, we should comply with the rules. If we are not complying with the rules, then the club is getting weaker. So that's basically what we talked about today, and I would like to express many thanks to all our guests, to all distinguished speakers for their contributions, and also to their contributions to, to, to this book, uh, which you have received. Some of the presentations are included in this book, so 
Thank you very much for the participation, and uh, you still have a break, 20 minutes, I think, and then next session.